So now we're going to hear um, from Ron as our speaker and my words for Ron. And I thought about this a lot um, because they, they don't sound like powerful words, but they are powerful to, to me and how I see him. They are action, listening, because I think Ron is one of the best listeners. When I'm talking to him, he's looking into my heart. That's different than just listening. And the third is responder. And that means like responder to not just needs, but the needs. So I had to qualify my words because um, they were, they were um, important. Okay, go Ron. Well, thank you, Jennifer. I'll try to remember those words and practice those in my life. <laughs> uh, today, this, we're going to continue the story that Paul actually uh, brought us up to last week. Uh, this is, comes out of Exodus uh, chapter 1, verse 8, up through chapter 2, verse 10. I'm not going to read that, but that's the, the place where, where uh, it's really the story of how Moses came into the, to the picture. But uh, Paul did a great job last week of bringing us up to the time when all of Jacob's family moved uh, to Egypt and were taken care of there because of Joseph and uh, the relationship that he had there. Uh, about 70 people, it said, were part of that entourage that moved to Egypt. Many years ago, passed away, many years go by, all the generation that moved has now passed away. Joseph, it said, lived up to an age of 110. You know, that would be, I guess, a goal for all of us to be productive for 110 years. And so more years pass away. So over a period of time, another Pharaoh now has come into power that doesn't know Joseph and all the things that he was, uh, had done for the people of Egypt as well. So the Hebrew people have multiplied, and it's a point where the Egyptians are becoming a little afraid of their numbers, uh, a lot of what ifs. So what if there was a war? What if the, they revolt? What if, and so on. So Pharaoh then appoints slave masters, and he works, quote, ruthlessly. But the people, Hebrew people continue to multiply and continue to grow. Pharaoh's concerned, so he had a plan. He says, I know what I do. So he said, all the midwives that were used there in that uh, country were told by the Pharaoh to kill all the male children when they were born, but let the women or the girls live on. The midwives didn't do it. So Pharaoh called them back in and they gave an excuse or something that they could say, said, well, you know, we're just so vigorous that they, don't, they have their children born when we don't even get there. So there's no way we can do it. Well, Pharaoh, you know, said, you know what? That's still not good enough. So go out, find all the male babies and throw them into the River Nile. Well, now we get to the story that there's a Levite man and his wife named Jochebed who had a son. And Jochebed hid him for three months, but that was about as long as she could hide him. But then, fearful of what the Pharaoh was doing, she made a waterproof basket and put the baby in it. Now, we all know this story, but think about the visual of that. She took the basket to the river and placed it in the reeds and asked her older daughter, Miriam, to watch it to see what would happen. Well, while walking along the river, the Pharaoh's daughter actually found the basket. She felt compassion on the crying infant. And Miriam asked her, well, would you like me to go find a nurse for the baby? And Pharaoh's daughter said, well, sure. So Miriam goes and gets Yochabad to become the nurse for this baby, to care for the child. And after the baby has grown some, Pharaoh's daughter takes him him as an, and gave him the name of Moses 
And the meaning of Moses was out of the water. Now we all know that story. We know the, the events and so on. But I today I would like to share you a top 10 list. 10 things I think that we can learn from the story. Number one, God is faithful. He's faithful to his covenant people. You are really never alone. God is always with you. Number two, King Pharaoh's power was reduced by the civil disobedience of compassionate women. The midwives didn't follow what the Pharaoh asked and got some change going on. And actually, his own daughter. Number three, God really is working his purposes out in all the events over time. You know, this isn't a quick fix. I always had a motto of plan your work and then work your plan. Number four, I think in this story, I've learned patience. Hundreds of years from the time that the Hebrew nation were in Europe, you know, they came, they were fed, they were accepted, they grew in numbers, they multiplied over time. But a lot of years took, took place in their journey while they were there in Egypt. Number five, Pharaoh's daughter took a big risk. She took a risk by her action of taking this baby, having him raised, and then carrying him as his own, as her own. When have you taken a risk? When have you taken a risk to help someone or to do some event? When have you shown compassion? When have you expressed kindness? Or when have I shown compassion? When have I expressed kindness? All events that I think of as I've read this story. Number six, it's courage, everyday challenge. You put your bake in a basket in a river. Don't think I could do that. You know, it takes hope to live this meaningful life. Patience, courage, hope. So, something that Paul reminded us of last week, he talked a little bit about the predestination thoughts. And so in that regard, I thought about this. Was Pharaoh's daughter finding the basket an accident or was it a design? Did Yochabad know the place that the daughter normally walked along the river and so she placed it in a spot where she knew? Was Miriam a friend? Was her daughter Miriam actually a friend of Pharaoh's daughter so, so that she could go up to her and ask her about finding a, a, a nurse? I don't know. All events that occurred in this story. Number eight, in our modern environment, there has been much oppression from the local school schoolyard bullying to racial and gender discrimination. As disciples, we find ways to disrupt and overturn systems and reality. To propel us and creation towards a life of freedom and a life of hope. Thought each of us had to others. They're, they are really just two commandments that we have that I would like to say keep it simple as Jennifer stated. Number one is love God. 
And number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Put your actions to the test of your beliefs. Practice love in everything you do. And number 10, God is working his purposes out in your life and in a journey that you're living. Believe, and as you believe, you achieve. As a summary of our learning in this expression and this story today, I would share with you the words of him 657. Make us, O oh God, a church that shares your love for humankind, that lives the truth your word declares and heeds the master's mind. Help us reach out with loving hands in times that try the soul with sympathy that understands and makes the needy whole. Make us, O oh God, a church that cares for every human need, that suffers when one life despairs and moves to intercede. Give to our voice prophetic power that stirs each wavering heart to meet the challenge of the hour and take a noble part. Make us, O oh God, a church that dares courageously to act, that clothes with flesh its fervent prayers and makes the gospel fact. Now thrust us from the cloistered halls where we want to hide and send us forth where duty calls to serve the crucified. May God's words and blessings be each of yours.